go, go for it, Jacob. Yeah. I would, I would just say um, the one thing that Alex laid out kind of last time we chatted is if you only paid 0.1 ETH for it, let's say you paid like $200, but gas fees were $100 to send it over to a burn address or, or to sell it or whatever, um, like the net negative, like the net loss that you would take against your own income might not outweigh the $100 you're paying in gas. So you kind of want to see about either like bundling and selling a bundle or, you know, really like weighing out, right? Like if you bought something for 15 K and it's effectively worth zero right now, then great. You could definitely, you know, it would make sense to send that into a burn address or, or whatever and, and take the full loss. But if you paid 200 for something and it's going to cost you a hundred just to throw it away, right. It might not be worth the write off. There may not be like much of a write off there to see like a, a net positive decision by doing that. Andrew can give you the more like actual, but, but you're saying I can answer, make but... a bundle that's called like NFT tax harvest loss bundle and price it at zero and hope somebody buys it. Basically, I mean, I'm looking at Keyboard Monkey's OpenSea right now, and he yeah, I saw that. Stuff. He just put a bunch of stuff down to zero, and he's just like, "Come buy it." Yeah, exactly. He should have bundled what... it. He should have just bundled these 15 assets instead of making 15 separate transactions, and he would have saved on gas. Got it. That's helpful. Yeah, but I think overall, Jacob's suggestion is a good one. Um, from a, a tax standpoint, we sometimes have clients that say, well, I'm holding this NFT or this token that's worthless and there's no liquidity. No one's going to buy it, um, but I want to report a loss. And I think that that would be a, a very difficult pill for the IRS to swallow um, because you're still retaining possession and control. And later, if the price goes up, that, and um, Charles always mentions this, the IRS has the benefit of hindsight perhaps years down the line price goes up and you want to take the position. Oh no, I, I actually have it. I didn't sell it. Um, and, and then, um, that would be even harder to argue. Um, so I think a good practice would be selling it. If you can, the bundle idea is a great one because then you're actually, uh, disposing of it to a third party and there's a transaction record for that. And if all else fails, then a potential position would be sending it to a burn address. But uh, I would say selling it would be a cleaner transaction overall. Understood. Thanks, guys. Um, we have a few other people who have requested. If you've asked a question and you got it answered, uh, feel free to just step down so we can get some other people up. Um, if you haven't an asked your question, you're up here. Uh, feel free to stay up. Um, and ask your question, but we'll uh, kind of rotate through right now and get some more people up. So as a, sorry, I'm new here, but has anyone gotten into any like blockchain domains at all? Any assets as far as that? You mean like ENS or like unstoppable domains type stuff? Yeah, particularly those two are the ones that I'm particularly in. Uh, in reference to what exactly so this is just a quick background kind of like a short story so we had web one right that was static web pages and then we had web two where we could interact with those web pages right and on those two forms of internet it was never anticipated that digital currency was going to be transacted on that internet so now we have crypto and crypto pretty much lets us transact money digitally so these ethereum addresses what the hype is that you can pretty much hyperlink your address for all the people out there that don't know what this is. Let's say you have alice.eth. You can get uh, in your crypto wallet, instead of typing an alphanumeric number, it's similar to how we have IP addresses. When we go to Google, we don't type in 8.8.8.8. We just type in google.com. We could type in alice.eth. And that, that I believe, if someone can correct me, I believe ethereum.eth is only for Ethereum payments, correct? Is this a question about taxes? Yeah, you got to have no, taxes can't... for us. Yes. Well, this is this is particularly leading to taxes because at least in the U.S., correct? Um, I believe it's only until twenty twenty three this NFT tax write off is going to be kind of a free free world, right? What is that? I don't understand where you're pegging a domain write off. Are you, I think I think maybe are you are you referring to if you if you sell domains, um, how you should uh, class them, um, like if they're a, like a cost of good. Yeah, I was, I was just giving some reference on the .eth domains, my bad, just because they are not they are minted as an NFT on the network. 
So I would assume that would be the same as writing off something similar to this, correct? Because like there are a lot of big transactions going with these usernames. Yeah, they're they're essentially an NFT, the Dottie. Yeah, if it's a Dottie, um, it's an NFT, so it'll be treated the same. Well, well, let's let's think about that a little bit. Um, the NFT that has a bored ape has a piece of intellectual property floating around that you can take the position uh, is property and is a capital asset so that when you sell it, you have either a short or long-term capital gain. I don't know that a domain name is necessarily the same thing. And so we'd have to think about whether a domain name is, rises to the level of a capital asset uh, or not. And if it doesn't, then the income would all be ordinary, which is where you would be if it were short-term capital gain. But if you had losses on the sale of a uh, .eth domain name, potentially that would be an ordinary loss because it's not a capital asset. So I, I, I think we need to think a little bit. I, I believe people who sell domain names right now, not through an NFT process, but just, you know, you, you, you get emails saying, do you want to buy, you know, this domain name or that domain name based on your web searches? Um, I believe they all pick that up as ordinary income. I, I don't think they're saying that they've got a capital asset that they're selling. So I, I do think they're, the, underlying, the underlying matter in the NFT, I think, does go to whether or not you have an ordinary income slash loss or a capital gain slash loss. Under, and, Andrew, any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, just a quick question on that, like if you could add on this too. Um, just so also like let's say I'm minting on Polygon now because we're talking about high gas fees. So with unstoppable domains, I can mint my domains on Polygon and I could pay a hundred dollars for that domain. Could I theoretically transact that and sell it to let's say like my friend for a dollar as another way of tax write off, just an, as an idea for the topic. Thank you. Well, if it's a real if it's a real sale, then yes, you get the loss. If it's a, I'll sell it to you for a dollar and, um, you know, a week from now we'll meet in a bar and you'll give me back, you'll give me more money for it, then it's not a real sale. So it, it depends, and it depends, you know, on if there's a market for these sorts of addresses, if the market is at, you know, two ETH and you sell it for 0.1 ETH, that's going to, <clears throat> if ever looked at, cause a problem. Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. Um, Web3, hopefully that, that covers your, your question. Yeah, that covered it well. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious about that because it is kind of like an iffy subject because technically they are minted as domains and I'm transacting them similarly as, you know, it would a board ape on the Polygon network. The only thing is, like, I don't know the Polygon yeah, network. I think, like, right? it's just, I think the, the, best, the best answer on this topic right now is going to be, like, really looking, I mean, frankly, I'm the only non-accountant attorney tax person, but like everything I've been told at this point from the crew is like, just don't commit fraud. If you go on Polygon just to mint a hundred dollar domain and then sell to your friend for a dollar repeatedly, like that's not creating an arm's length sale. That's not like a fair market sale or loss, right? You're just manufacturing a hundred dollar L repeatedly. Like that's going to be fraud. If anyone decides to look uh, personally, it. I would so, definitely go the LLC route and then route it through a business. You know what I mean? And then have, but I, I heard about someone that was, um, had a couple domain names and he actually contacted a lawyer and now he's starting an LLC for his domain names. And then his crypto staking, he's writing off his crypto staking earnings with the LLC. Well, yeah, we're, we're in, we're like, in. we're in, basically we're in good, good for that guy territory. Like that's some pretty bespoke, like, I don't know what their advice is from um, or why, but 
Like that doesn't sound like it would work still to just throw up an entity and sell to your buddy for a hundred dollar loss on a bunch of domains. Um, but you know, uh, kinda... not, not, not selling for a loss, just setting up an LLC as a domain, like, you know, selling blockchain domains and then having like corporate, like, you know, fees and like whatever. Well, the, let, let, let's, let's parse through that. So for tax purposes, a single member LLC doesn't exist. It exists for corporate law purposes. It exists for limited liability purposes. But as far as the IRS, the, the California Franchise Tax Board, the New York tax authorities, they don't care. It doesn't exist at all. And whatever it's done on the LLC is picked up on your personal tax return on Schedule C, just as if you did it directly. So having an LLC by itself doesn't give you any tax benefits that you wouldn't get if you did it directly. So it, 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 it helps to show that you're in a business because you've got a separate set of books and records and you keep track of things perhaps better than if you did it yourself, but merely throwing up a LLC, single member LLC, or a single member, a single shareholder S Corp isn't typically going to get you any tax benefits that you wouldn't have gotten had you just done it directly. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Um, Let's see who else. uh, Who else has a question? Hey, I, I got a question. Thanks, thanks for thanks for doing this again, guys. I appreciate it. Um, I've, I've spoken to several of you offline and several other CPAs. I've been trying to make sense of, of NFT airdrops. And, you know, it seems to me there's sort of three broad categories that we're dealing with. There's sort of something like, you know, the mutant serum where it was sort of dropped over a period of time. And when you received it, there may have been a sale for $30,000 right before you received it. And the general guidance I'm getting is like, hey, maybe you should look at that and maybe you've just actually gotten $30,000 of income. Then then there's the case of, you know, sort of the, the board of Yacht Club dogs where we had to go onto the website, pay gas and mint it for zero and it was gas only. And, I, and I, I've been trying to figure out where does that fall in? Is that technically an airdrop? I mean, it's similar to ENS where we had to go and pay gas and claim the tokens. So maybe we're looking at the value of that where we claimed it too. And then there's sort of the third category, you get these polygon airdrops where they all drop at the same time, there's zero sales before you have them, and maybe it's it's zero income. And I'm, I'm just trying to sort of figure out those three broad categories and get some thoughts in, in terms of, of how, you know, how we might treat those in terms of, of, is that income when we receive it? Where should we be pegging it? you know, how to calculate cost basis based upon that. Um, so that, that, that's my question, if that makes sense. Yeah, all, all good questions. And I'll take a stab at uh, some of those. So um, as a, a general statement, um, the IRS has issued guidance in the context of airdrops and, and forks um, that if you have dominion and control, um, that you have income at the fair market value at the time of that dominion and control. In the eyes of the IRS, it doesn't matter where it came from, who it came from. If you have, in their words, what's referred to as an ascension of wealth, then you have income. You get something new, you have income at that fair market value. However, there are so many cases that don't fit that clean pattern of, for instance, a uh, Bitcoin cash fork which is very clear, or uh, an airdrop that, um, that doesn't require gas or certain things to happen. Um, many fact patterns exist as, um, I forgot who the speaker is, but as, as you identified, where either you have to take certain steps to claim, you've got to spend gas, and uh, let's quickly talk about that, or that you're receiving it, such as the Polygon airdrop, and there is no stated price. So first with the, the Polygon airdrops, um, the IRS would say that if you receive something new, it has some value, um, and you should report something. Now, what that amount is, that's where it, it really comes up to uh, yourself and your practitioner to try to identify a price. 
Um, sometimes there is a market price the next day, and you can use, for instance, the first trading value. Um, but it, it really depends on the circumstances. Um, and so that's one fact pattern. The other is that you have to pay gas to claim it. Um, the ENS airdrop, for instance, is one that's similar to that. Um, and uh, a good rule of thumb is that once the value of that airdrop exceeds what you're paying in gas, or even if that instantly occurs, then you have an ascension of wealth. You have an uh, income event. The way that the gas fee itself is treated, that is still something that we're actually internally debating. And I think Charles might have a position on this. But for instance, if you receive an airdrop that's worth $10, but it costs you $4 in gas to claim, is the airdrop only worth 6 Or conversely, do you have $10 of income, but your cost basis is 14 Hmm. That's one that we're still working through. And I'm interested to see what, what um, Charles has to say. But overall, even though you have a gas fee, that doesn't necessarily negate the fact that you have a, an income event, as long as that value of the income is, is higher than the gas fee overall. Charles? Yeah, I, I agree completely. And the, the, the key, although it sounds lengthy, is dominion and control. So if, 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 the, if the airdrop happens on a Monday and gas is 100 and it's worth 200 and you wait and say, no, 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 I'm not going to – 200 is too high. I don't want to pick up 200 in income, so I'm going to wait for a week and then – It'll drop to 150, and then at that point, I'll claim it and get it. If the IRS ever look at it, they'll say, wait a second. You could have gotten it when it was 200. You chose not to. That's just like telling someone, don't pay me today. Pay me in you know January 2nd, so I pick up the income in 2022, and they'll say that you had income on the Monday – when you could have claimed it. Um, if other people control when you can claim it, so if you get it on a Monday, but you can't claim it until Thursday, or you can't claim it until certain events have happened, then you don't have dominion and control yet because you can't actually grab it. So it, it's a facts and circumstances um, <coughs> as to when you have dominion and control, but the moment you could have taken it and chose not to, that's that that's a dead giveaway that, that you have dominion and control. And then on, on the gas fee side, Andrew, I mean my view is if it's worth ten and you or if it's worth two hundred and you paid a hundred in gas to get it, you've got a basis of three hundred. Because you bought the 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 crypto or the NFT is a is property, and you paid a hundred in order to get the property, so that adds to your basis. It does. You don't get to deduct a hundred in gas. You have to add it to your basis. Right, and I would, I would agree. I think that's the conservative position. That's one that we would generally go with. Um, but it's in some ways counterintuitive, right? Because you still pick up the ten dollars of income. And so what if it was uh, $10 in value, but $5 to get, so it's 50-50, well, that seems to be almost a, quite a negative tax result. And I, and I understand, and I'm the first one to say usually, that the, the tax code doesn't always have common sense. Yeah. Um, but that could be a, a fairly negative result. You're paying, you end up paying almost as much in taxes as the value of the airdrop that you netted. Exactly. And that leads to an interesting point, which is, in areas where the issue is gray and there are potentially alternative conclusions, one of the things you need to do is talk to your CPA because even if you think, for example, in Andrew's case, that it's 10 and 5 and you should only pick up 5, Andrew, if he's your CPA, has to sign your tax return, and he, as the tax return preparer, has to feel comfortable that there's a reasonable basis for that position. So where things are gray, 
you not only have to figure out is it gray and which way you're going to go, but you also need to work closely with your accountant to make sure that your accountant is going to be comfortable signing that tax return. One hey, Charles, Charles can, can, I, can, I, can I ask one, one follow-up on the dominion and control? It, it, as, as far as that goes, I mean, if, if, if you take that to its, its logical extreme, though, I mean, theoretically, you could claim the airdrop in the first second it's available before it has any value, right? And, and so I, I guess it, it becomes a question like, you know, if you, for ENS, for example, like I claimed it a half hour afterwards when its price was, you know, $40 a token. But if, if you, and it, so I would think that I'd have a, you know, fair market value of 40 times how many, ever many tokens I have. But I mean, if you take sort of dominion control to, to the extreme, I could have a zero cost basis because I could have claimed it the millisecond it was released when it had no value. So, I mean, w w where do you sort of draw that line in terms of, of what's, you know, a reasonable claim window of, of, of where you're pegging that value? Uh, there is no clear answer. It's all facts and circumstances. And <clears throat> the, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I, I often refer to a phrase that people have with respect to uh, the stock market, which is you can make money as a bear and you can make money as a bull, but you can't make money as a pig. <laughs> so you want to take a position that is reasonable, where you can sit on the other side of a table from a cranky IRS agent <laughs> and with a straight face, argue your position. So Got if it. you were awake when the airdrop happened and you claimed your, your tokens, your NFTs or whatever at that moment, and there was no value, then I would say, go with that. You've yeah. got a good set of facts. If you claimed them when they were $40 a token, then, you know, trying to argue that I could have claimed them six hours earlier, <clears throat> but I didn't, um, gets to be hard to do. God. So, so it's basically you know, be reasonable and, and don't commit fraud. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Wait, it. are you Those are, you are willing perfect to accept, takeaways. Are you willing to accept such simple advice such as be reasonable and don't commit fraud because we could stop the room right now <laughs> if that's what we had to do. Be reasonable, don't commit fraud, selling to your own wallet is a bad idea, selling to your friend's wallet is a bad idea. Right. Like there's some pretty simple bullet points here that we could end it on that. But uh, I mean, the, 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 more, the more CPAs and attorneys I talk to, I mean, no, nobody seems to agree on any of this. And that seems to be the underlying thing of have a reasonable position, be consistent and don't commit fraud. I mean, that, that seems to be where a lot of these things are coming down to. Yeah. You know, yes, I would say they are. one thing one thing I'm seeing that, you know, I, I mean, like I said, so it's it's kind of helpful for me as the non tax person. Like I'm not an accountant or a tax attorney. I'm just like helping synthesize everything I see here and, 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 you know, kind of help pull together the NFT tax guide um, that, you know, we did for crypto, DeFi, NFTs, whatever. Um, but what I'm seeing a lot of is kind of the comment Charles made a minute ago that I think is really important, which is whatever you end up doing like you're going to need an accountant that can like comfortably and ethically sign off on what you did. Right. And if they sign off on it, it's not to say that you're just straight up good. Right. Like, I mean, obviously Andrew, Charles, you can talk about the like legality side, but basically if someone else is signing off on your taxes, like that's on their head kind of professionally that they looked at it, they understood it. They understood the transactions that you're reporting. And, you know, I've had, I know someone who mentioned to me that they don't believe taking ETH into a crypto punk and then selling that punk and having ETH again is a taxable transaction. Well, frankly, I think that's insane. And that CPA is going to be in a world of hurt in a year or two if that's what they're telling people. They're for sure going to get audited. All of their clients are going to get audited and they're probably going to lose their license because that one's pretty clear at this point. But there are still people who say BTC to ETH or ETH into an NFT like aren't taxable transactions. And just because they say that doesn't mean they're right. So I would venture to say some of this stuff is gray as far as the exact moment that you could or couldn't claim banana and there was or wasn't a liquidity pool for ENS, right? 
Like those are things that require a reasonable basis to figure out reasonably where you stood and like, are you trying to pull a fast one on the IRS? Like they're going to be on the lookout for people trying to pull fast ones. But if you're trying to take your entire freaking tax return and say, oh yeah, all I did was a thousand transactions, but none of them were taxable. Thanks. And my CPA signed off on it. Like, good luck. Everyone in that, in that situation is going to get audited. So I agree with you that I'm hearing a lot of people disagree, but like probably 70 or 80% of this is not gray space, right? Like I see Andrew, you unmuted. So can you hop in? Yeah. 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 Not only that, that it's not gray space, but although a CPA may sign off on the return, the responsibility is still on you. They may have their own professional issues as a result, but one thing that people often don't realize is that you're still responsible for what's on your tax return. And it's just saying, oh, well, the CPA said it's right or this is how to do it. That won't get you out of taxes in the future if you're audited. It may, may not get you out of penalties. Although in many of these situations, the CPA points the finger right back and says, nope, I was just a preparer. I entered the information they provided. And that's the extent of my responsibility. So it's very important to make sure that you have a good professional that is applying the correct law and identifying what is gray and what is not. Because although they may be signing their name, the IRS is going to be looking at you and care much more about you than them. Yeah, and this is where, uh, to Jacob's point, Yes, there are things that are gray. When do you have dominion and control? There are things that are black and white. You exchange one F NFT for another. You exchange ETH for Bitcoin. You use appreciated ETH to buy a board ape. Those are black and white. Those are taxable events, whether you like it or not. And the, the, the thing that you don't want to have happen is you take an aggressive position on something that is a big item. The IRS looks at it, <clears throat> and now they're going to look not just at that transaction. They're going to tear apart your whole tax return. And who knows what other aggressive positions might be in that tax return that you would prefer they not be looking at. So, you know, if you're going to be aggressive then you need to understand the risks that arise from being aggressive and decide whether or not the risks that you're taking are worth the w worthwhile. Um, and then to, to, An to Andrew's point, if, if you just have your, if you just give stuff to the accountant and you have a questionable position and you don't get something in writing that specifically addresses your situation, your facts, all the facts, and the law, you're not going to be able to rely on whatever the accountant told you to avoid penalties. So if you do have a, an aggressive position that you think is reasonable, then you know talk to a lawyer, talk to an accountant, get something in writing so that you can rely on it, uh, to avoid penalties down the road. 100% agree. 100% agree. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, we went on a very good, I think, you know, little marathon on that topic. Um, and, you know, I think, I think this is, these are topics that we need to discuss. I think this is valuable information. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we'll hopefully try to get in some other ones. We got about 20 minutes left here. Um, we'll get some more people up on stage. Um, if you saw haven't asked a question um and you're up here feel free to if you have asked a question um just make some space we're going to get some other people up here uh Kilroy, what's up yeah i saw Matt dragon had a had a question had raised his hand a while ago so i wanted to see if he had a question hey what's up guys oh i was i was gonna bring it back to the um when you guys were talking about what do you do oh you're the harvest guy this is the i'm harvest the harvest guy. guy let's go harvest <laughs> guy all right. Come on down Tell to us. the farm, guys. That's right. Tell us about it. <laughs> so uh, Farmer Harvey uh, at Harvest.Art, um, willing. he wants to buy all your junk. So if you guys if you guys have a bunch of stuff and you 
can't get a seller for it. You know, you make your bundles and no one's buying whatever. Farmer Harvey will buy anything off of you. He's not going to pay you very much at all, but he's going to pay you more than zero. So check it out. Links to my profile. Yeah, he'll just take all that junk. He'll turn it into like compost and like enrich the soil. <laughs> so to give it to give it the uh, I guess the adult TLDR is uh, harvest here. Which gosh, if you start rugging people after coming on stage, I'm gonna feel like trash. Do your own research, people. Um, <laughs> look for other transactions that happened before you on this on this software. But what he's built is something where you can bundle. Let's say you you find five NFTs or 50 NFTs that you want to sell. You, none of them have a market. You can bundle all of those into a single transaction through Harvest and he'll buy them from you for like 0.001 ETH. But it's like a single purchase sale, a single gas transaction. And then you would well, be looking to mark sorry. down all of those assets, right? Or, or give us oh. the, the mechanics. <laughs> the proof of concept contract, uh, very simple. It doesn't even include bundling. So Right now, if you're going to use the uh, use the contract, um, it will pay you uh, a minimal amount of ether back, uh, but they're each individual transactions. Uh, so I would cherry pick your, you know, your highest ROI um, assets um, until well, I don't know if I'm going to have time. I'm really I want to try to get a uh, an improved, more upgraded contract that's more efficient before the end of the year, but. For right now, it's just very basic. Um, yeah, you can batch them, but it's going to be individual transactions per NFT. Um, and that's all essentially it does. The contract will accept uh, ERC-721 NFTs or 1155s, and then it just pays you back um, just a little bit of Ether for each of them. And that's it. I want your junk. So sell it to me. Awesome. This is some raised barbecue and foot massage level <laughs> level memory. Um, if anybody knows that reference, congrats! You're you're an internet boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's also I think that's a great resource for um, obviously burning and and you know harvesting losses. Do your own research though. Um, yeah, because I yeah. think I think my, my when I was looking at the burning, it felt like the. Uh, that's I feel like that's harder to defend, right? Because there's no counterparty. You're essentially lighting your art on fire, right? But I'm not obviously a lawyer or anything. I've I'm just like I want to buy this junk, and I was in a bunch of projects that were rugged. I'm like no one. There's no liquidity. I was with these in these discords, and there was people who were trying to sell bundles at zero for like months, and it was like, you know, the people who are buying them don't even want to pay the gas to buy them, but like for the person who wants to sell them, right? So this contract just basically gives you instant liquidity um, and future versions, I think, right, will have different pricing for, uh, I want it to eventually act like the floor um, for all different sorts of contracts. But right now, it just does one thing and that's it. But yes, do your own research. Wonderful. All right. There's no, you know, well, thank you, no thank you for sharing. That's that's a great resource to uh, yeah to hear about, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, sure I think we got some other speakers up here now. Uh, we have Deep House ETH also up here. Uh, cr- lovely crypto crypto toad. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, uh, I just had a quick question. Um, uh, I see that Mike has hand raised, but this should probably only take like a, a minute or two to answer. Um. So for a lot of us who are looking to, you know, hire a tax pro either through Zen Ledger or one of you directly, um, I'm, I'm aware that when you pay someone to do your taxes, just on a general level, you would be able to potentially write some of that off. Um, let's say, you know, some of us have done a lot of transactions over the past year. If we ended up paying, you know, let's say $10,000 just to have our crypto taxes done, um, would that be able to be written off on um, our basically our, our our entire tax return? That would be that's my main question. So it depends on the type of taxpayer you are. If you're an individual or a business, if you're an individual, uh, tax preparation and accounting fees, and for that matter, even investment expenses 
were previously deductible, but I believe it was in 2018 uh, that the tax code changed and the tax preparation fees, for instance, are no longer deductible. They used to be itemized deductions on Schedule A, but that's no longer the case for individuals. So as an individual taxpayer, um, unless Charles have or Alex have some other uh, great ideas, uh, typically it is not deductible. And but for a business, yeah, go for it. Oh, and just just to just add on to that point, because I know we've discussed this a lot and people bring this up. If you're a single member LLC, it would be the same thing, correct? Correct. Um, we talked about it at the beginning of the spaces, but forming a single member LLC doesn't change the character of your activity and or make it a business if it wasn't previously. So we have clients that are investors or trader, uh, trading uh, crypto or NFTs, and they want to call themselves traders. But really, in the eyes of the IRS, they're nothing but investors. There's actually a distinction. And so forming an LLC and then just putting your activity in that doesn't turn it into a business. Uh, Charles put it uh, best earlier. Actually, an LLC for tax purposes is nothing at all. So, no, the LLC won't change uh, whether or not you can deduct it. But if you were a business, it doesn't matter if it was an LLC. It doesn't matter if you're just a sole proprietor. As a business, um, then you generally can deduct accounting fees, tax preparation fees, and things like that. Whether or not your activity rises to the level of being considered a business, that's a fact-intensive inquiry. And we go through with our clients looking at their activity, their frequency of trading, things like that. Or in the NFT space, there's actually an entire series of uh, literature and guidance on what constitutes being an art dealer. So arguably, NFT uh, traders could be considered art dealers, but you'd have to meet certain requirements, and then it would be a business and potentially deductible. Um, but just for a, an individual trading NFTs, selling NFTs, uh, typically not. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great question. Uh, nice, short, simple, to the point. Um, we're going to try to keep the rest of the questions that way for the last uh, 12 minutes we have here. Mike, you have your hand up. Uh, Hunter, just want to add one bit to that, and then we of can course. move on. Um, on the federal side, it is 100% correct that you can't deduct um, the expense for our services um, at a federal level. Certain states do still allow that deduction. Um, so you might be able to take that deduction on your state side, but not on the federal level, which is the highest tax rate out of the two. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Awesome. Uh, Mike, you've had your hand up. Feel free to ask a question. How are you doing? GM, everybody. Thanks for having this space. Uh, love that there's all you guys trying to help us do the right thing with Uncle Sam. Um, and shout out to Dragon. I didn't even know the farm, the harvest.art existed. Um, I might have some chads for you. But um, my question is for Dan and uh, specifically for Zen Ledger. Um, I'm wondering if it's when I, when I go to connect my MetaMask or import my MetaMask wallet, you can choose between different chains like ETH. Uh, there's support for Polygon, everything to Ripple, Polkadot, et cetera. I'm wondering about alternate L1s and L2s like. Arbitrum and AVAX, I've got some farming going on in those, but they're not listed there. Is the route to go, do I just sort of import the CSV from the relevant Etherscan fork, or is there are there extra steps I have to do to kind of manually go through all that stuff to account for that through the app? Yeah, <clears throat> great question. Um, so for now, I think we support like 45 or so blockchains. It sounds like you may be in the app at the moment. So you'll see kind of that drop down, uh, as you mentioned, you know, like Kava, Iris, Polkadot, Cosmos, etc. cetera. Um, for AVAX and Solana, those are the next two uh, blockchains that we're adding. Uh, both should be live before the end of the year. Um, so over the next like two weeks or so. And then we'll add uh, Phantom and um, and Luna support over the first two weeks of, of January. Um, so for us, we're you know we're always trying to keep up. Um, <clears throat> one of the the fun parts about this industry is the pace of innovation. Uh, but being on the builder side, especially when you're connecting to all these blockchains and wallets and and uh, L1s and L2s, it's uh, always trying to stack rank. You know what's uh, most impactful for our customers. So the short answer to your question is: for now, um, you need to use a custom CSV. Where if you go to imports, add account, 
<clears throat> you'll see four different tabs, exchanges, custom CSV, manual, and then wallet import. The custom CSV is typically better for, you know, probably 20 and above transactions. Manual is easier for, for smaller amounts. Um, we also have our customer support team that's standing by 12 hours a day, seven days a week via email, phone, and chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you'd like, you can just send us, you know, that Etherscan link, and we can do the formatting for you and import it. Um, so, yeah, uh, long long answer. We're, we're working on building that in natively. Short answer, there's still workarounds, and we'd be happy to help you with that. Awesome. So the, the best route would be to just go directly to customer support and then link them to that, and they can kind of walk me through it rather than trying to stumble around uploading it myself. Yeah, the, the custom CSV, we also have like video guides of like our team going through the custom CSV. Essentially, the custom CSV, the way you can think of it is like a blanket. Um, essentially, we provide like the high level uh, columns and then we'll provide sample data in there, like, you know, incoming, in amount, out amount, fee, timestamp, exchange, those types of things. And then essentially, you're just copy and pasting that information directly into the CSV. And then since it's already in our custom CSV format, it automatically imports. And the reason that's important is typically, like, depending on the blockchain or the exchange, they can provide their data formats in completely different variations. So we kind of have this, like, universal CSV that integrates whatever we don't natively support for now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, you can give it a try if you'd like. We will provide, like, step-by-step -step instructions, a video guide. Or if you prefer, you can just send it directly to our team with the address. Um, and we'll pull it up on a block explorer, look through the transaction activity, format it, and import it for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. It, it, it's, it's so refreshing, Dan, in this day and age to see that there are people who still believe in customer support. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a large part of our business, not only on the customer acquisition side, but on the customer retention side. Um, you know, we are not 100 percent perfect. Um, I would say that for like any crypto tax software. So there's typically going to, you know, you're going to need a little bit of manual work, a little bit of adjustment. And, you know, what I like to think is, you know, anytime people are looking at finances, health, wealth, um, you know, food, like they want to ensure that they can talk to a human being and, and be accurate in what they're doing. So, you know, we wanted to invest heavily in customer support uh, across email, phone and chat. <clears throat> and, you know, I would put our support team up against, you know, literally any company in crypto, even outside of crypto. Um, so yeah, if you run into any issues, you know, you can always give us a call, uh, you know, send us an email, send us a chat. We're available 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And then, you know, as we walked through earlier, you know, we're always looking to add additional integrations, which is going to kind of cut down on the amount of times that you'll hopefully need to reach out. But, you know, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just want to, you know, talk through, you know, we're always happy to help in any way we can. Awesome. Love it. Um, so let's see, we got iced NFT up here. Um, Mike, thank you for your question. Uh, awesome to, to see another board ape up here. Um, iced, how are you doing? GM. How can we hey, hey. Yeah, no, um, thank you guys so much for, you know, hosting this space. Really appreciate it. You guys are helping so many of us and most importantly, bring awareness to this tax shit that I like didn't even consider for a while. Um, so my first question, well, my question is pretty much about um, like selling an NFT and then buying other NFTs or other stocks. Um, would I be needing to still be paying tax on a complete profit that I made over that NFT? Or since I um, decided to reinvest in other things, I would only be paying taxes on the leftover profits. Oh, would that it be that it was only on the leftover profits? Uh, no. Un unfortunately, if you uh, bought something for 2 ETH and you sell it for 10 ETH, and then you take the 10 ETH or 8 of the 10 ETH and you buy something else, you pay tax on <coughs> the the 8 ETH gain, and then, and then you've got an 8 ETH basis in the new property so when you sell off your 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 nfts you need to make sure you hold on to enough dollars to be able to pay the taxes otherwise down the road you're going to have to sell something at a time that you may not want to sell it gotcha so just to clarify say um normally like these nfts get taxed like say 30 percent collectible or whatever I make eight ETH of profit, even if I invest all eight ETH into a new NFT or new 
um, I guess, investment, like a stock, I would still be having to pay like that 30% on 8 Ethereum, correct? Uh, yes, although unless, my, my view is that unless they're, the NFT goes to a physical piece of art, if it, if it goes to a digital piece of art, my view is that at the moment that is not a collectible under the tax code and therefore you get a 20% rate, not a 28% rate, but um, that's a minor difference. But yes, the, the point is you, you look at each transaction separately and if you make a gain on one transaction, you pay tax on that gain. And then if you take some of the money and reinvest it in another NFT, that's a new transaction and you get a new basis and everything. Gotcha. Thank you so much for the explanation. I appreciate it. It looks like we have time for one more question. Rayway, uh, if you have a question, we'll quickly get to it uh, before we do a little outro. Um, and we'll let Jacob plug his project. Hello? Hey, what's up, Rayway? We can hear you. Hi. Um, I have a question that probably has been asked a lot before. Um, do gas fees, um, are we allowed to like tax deduct gas fees or not? Hello? Hey. So it depends on uh, what the gas cost or fees are for. So if you're incurring a gas cost for simply moving it from um, one wallet to another wallet, those costs are not tax deductible. If you are incurring a gas fee either on the purchase or disposal of an NFT, those gas costs or gas fees are uh, deductible. They're basically included <clears throat> in your cost basis and as a, as a result, reducing your taxable income. And, and that's for businesses and people, like for everybody, right? Yeah, it, there, there's a slight question as to if you're a business, what is the purpose of that transfer? If it's for purely transferring not a deductible expense um but if you're incurring uh gas fees because of a business related transaction so like you're paying a contractor and there's an additional cost of gas fees in order to pay that contractor then in that case um that's an basically a, a wire fee it's similar to a wire fee and you would be able to write off that expense because uh, you're paying an outside party and it's going out to somebody else. All right. Thank you. Yep. I think that's a great question to wrap on. And I, it's obviously one that's asked time and time again. Um, and I can assure you, uh, the CPAs up here, uh, that is not the last time that they will hear that question. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I think it was a great hour of kind of just chatting and, and, you know, discussing different situations um, and bringing more awareness to taxes in the NFT economy. Um, you know, make sure you're following all the speakers that are up here. These are amazing resources, people that you should reach out to hire. Um, Jacob uh, has launched the NFT tax guide, which is pinged above. Um, and you know, that's, that allows you not only to get some great information, but access into Zen ledgers tax software, uh, which is a great piece of software that allows you to quickly, uh, realize how many, you know, short-term, long-term games you ha have your cost basis, uh, and get an idea of what you owe on taxes for the year. Um, Jacob, any words on that, uh, that I've missed besides also that there's Sartoshi art attached to it. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's it, right? This this these guys up here worked on this project with me. Um and and you know, and I think we're losing you. Andrew's He's getting rugged. Yeah, yeah, getting rugged. Andrew's CPA, Charles is a lawyer, Dan works at Zen Ledger. Um, you know. Oh, he got hardcore rugged. 
Uh, Kilroy. <laughs> Um, if, if I may add one thing to that Jacob didn't mention, sure. which is, you know, to the extent that people uh, do buy the NFT guide, a portion, Jacob's plan is that a portion of the funds that get raised will be used to help fund the tax preparation work for people who are crypto NFT artists and, and need some help. So there, there's some good that's happening independent of 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 all the good stuff that you otherwise get you're you're contributing to helping uh starving artists get their tax returns done properly a hundred percent and i think that's such a such an important and powerful statement that that's been included in in their roadmap and and that they're thinking of these people um I'm, i'm very excited to to see what happens with that uh as that unfolds Oh, everybody, it's 7.02 here on the East Coast. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. It's a pleasure to see all of your faces and great people. See, we have Tony and Dylan and uh, a lot of other great people in the space. Um, looking forward to seeing you guys next week when we do another space. We're going to keep running these back. Um, new topics, new people, new situations. Uh, until then, have a good one. Do your taxes uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Peace, everybody.